Thank you, Annalisa. And um, I'd like to thank um, Ed Friedman and all of the, and um, Kate and all of the other folks who've worked on putting this together. And I'm grateful for the, um, the kind opportunity and, and um, to be here with all of you and uh, to offer the comments that I get to today. Um, at least two plays by Lope de Vega best, uh, bear resemblances to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Castelvinus y Montesis is a literary cousin to Shakespeare's play and shares some of its characters and their relationships. Lope's El Caballero de Olmedo has no specific familial connection to Romeo and Juliet, but shares its literary mode and broad plot outline. If we used the same terminology to, uh, sorry, <laughs> I've lost my place and it's not even technology. If we use the same terminology to talk about the plays of Spain's golden age as we do with Shakespeare's plays, we might call these two plays by the father of Spanish national theater problem plays. Both Castelvinus and El Caballero offer one set of expectations to the audience and then turn away from those expectations drastically in the final act and deny the spectators the anticipated outcome. At least in, in part, their relationship with Romeo and Juliet is the problem for these Lope plays. On one hand, Castelvinus should end tragically as Romeo and Juliet does because both plays recount the same story of two young lovers from rival clans in Verona. On the other hand, El Caballero and Romeo and Juliet should end happily because both plays begin as romantic comedies. The originality of the two Lope plays about the consequences and outcomes of rash young love lies in the choices the playwright makes to break with tragic and comic conventions and defy audience expectations. When we call a play a tragic comedy, we mean that it blends tragic and comic elements but this simple definition does little to clarify the ways in which these modes mix, function, and mean in individual texts. The modes blend very differently in Lope's two plays. The way the mix of tragic and comic elements works in them has to do with their intertextual nature. Neither play merely alludes to previous texts. We got more sound. Neither play merely alludes to previous texts. Rather, they both originate from prior works. The difference in outcome in the two plot lines depends in some measure on the ways in which the plays respond to their source text. Lope's happy ending to the Romeo and Juliet story in Castelvinus offers spectators a more hopeful world view and a parody of the source text that should surprise and delight the audience. In contrast, in El Caballero del Medo, Lope's source texts impose themselves on the tragic ending, but Lope creates a masterpiece in which the sharp contrast between comedy and tragedy heightens the audience's reaction of pity and fear. The evocation of appropriate comic and tragic responses from the audience cannot depend alone on Lope's written text. It also requires comic and tragic production values. A performance text of either play should reveal Lope's versatility as a playwright and also foreground the flexibility of the acting company that can move seamlessly from a tragic to a comic register uh, or vice versa. Decisions about blocking, gesture, facial expression, tone of voice, pacing, lighting, sound effects, and music will create the tragic sense of nobility, dignity, danger, profundity, and moral dilemma in two acts of a play, and the comic tone of lightheartedness, wit, exaggeration, and congruity, and ridicule in another act. In her 2004 book, The Name and Nature of Tragic Comedy, Verna Foster recognizes differences in the way tragic comedies resolve in different historical periods. Two broad distinctions between Renaissance and modern tragic comedy should be made at the outset, she says. In Renaissance tragic comedy, the suffering or erring protagonists are usually potentially tragic figures in an ultimately comic universe. In modern tragic comedy, the individual is more often a comic figure in a universe probably tragic or at best uncertain. Foster goes on to explain that the Renaissance genre tragic comedy was a form of comedy. According to Foster, this idea fits accurately with both Renaissance theory and practice. 
several early modern Spanish texts that authors labeled as tragicomedias, La Celestina and El Caballero de Olmedo spring to mind, do not fit this pattern. But Castelvines does. Lope's protagonists, Rossello and Julia, are figures just as potentially tragic as Romeo and Juliet. Both pairs of lovers descend from an extensive literary family tree that includes most famously a novella by Matteo Bandello, La Sfornata, La Sfornata Morte di Dui Infelicissimi Amanti. The novella was translated into French and then that translation into Spanish in 1589. Lope likely used the Spanish translation as a source text, but could have known the novella in French and the, and Italian, and the French and Italian versions as well. Shakespeare's immediate source for the story of his star-crossed lovers was a poem in English by Arthur Brooke called The Tragical History of Romeus and, and Juliet, based on Bandello and the French, tra French translation. In every version of the story prior to Castelvinus y Montesis, the Romeo and Juliet characters die tragically, so the accumulated weight of tragedy from the multiple source texts comes along with the main characters when Lope re recasts their story. The first two acts of the play forebode tragedy and require a more serious tragic register in performance. As the play opens, Rossello and two companions stand outside Julia's house. Ro Rossello wants to crash the party, but his servant Marin complains that the house belongs to Rossello's enemies. He says, son gente cruel y fiera, los del bando Castelvin. Anselmo reminds Rossello, el peligro es notable, porque del bando Montes tu padre cabeza es, y aún no sufre que se hable de esta gente en su presencia. Marin's following lines may be, take, may be taken humorously, but it is dark humor that describes the sharp teeth of the open, furious mouths of the dogs that belong to the two factions. Danger builds throughout the first act of the play as Rossello and Julia meet secretly in the garden of her house. Julia's servant, Thalia, tells her she should forget Rossello. Her parents will never agree to the relationship. Antes te darán a un moro, tus padres. Rossello and Julia marry secretly, and the instability of their situation escalates in the second act when two of the Montes women take over Dorotea Castelvin's place in church. This petty act leads to a face-off between the two families. Explicit stage directions describe the scene. Salgan al teatro las espadas desnudas y póngase a una parte Antonio Castelvin, Teobaldo, Otavio y Fesenio, Julia's father, uncle, and cousins y de la otra, Fabricio, Lidio, Marín y Anselmo, de Monteses, y en medio foro, Rossello. The scene will not end happily. Rossello struggles to quell the anger of the two groups, but Otavio, Julia's cousin and suitor, provokes Rossello, who kills Otavio. The Lord of Verona arrives on scene and banishes Rossello, who, is, who in this precarious circumstance returns to Julia's garden to bid her farewell. Otavio's father, Teobaldo, who sometimes speaks with the voice of reason in the play, declares war on the Monteses. In spite of the burden of all of these signs of sometimes realized violence and potential tragedy, in the end, Rossello and Julia exist in a comic universe. Lope rejects the tragic ending, and the tone and mode of the play shift radically in the final act. Lope delivers a conventionally light-hearted comic ending with a strong female character who uses her wit to manage the blocking character and maneuver the happy outcome of her romantic desire. Ironically, Lope moves to the comic mode in the most unlikely location. Cynthia Rodriguez uh, Badendijk recognizes the first place that Lope makes us laugh aloud the setting of the first scene played for pure, broad, comic effect is the tomb. The Capulet family crypt is the site of the double suicide in Shakespeare's play, just as it serves as the location of the deaths of the couple in all the source texts. Surely Lope chooses this setting to turn toward comedy on purpose. Julia awakens from a drug-induced death-like trance entombed in darkness. 
Rosello and Mar Marin enter bearing light, but also a comic fear of the dark and the tomb. The following film clip comes from a performance by the Andac Stage Company of an English verse translation of the play by Dakin Matthews. Based in Hollywood, they performed their version of Castel Venus at the Chamisal Siglo de Oro Drama Festival. Please watch for the comic stage business, the gracioso silliness and impatience, and the scatological humor. <laughs> Why didn't you just leave me outside? Then I could guard the door out there. Wouldn't that be the smart thing to do? Then Volio's enough to take care of anything that might occur. Well, come on in. There's nothing in the least bit to be afraid of. Well, wouldn't it be better for us to come in after the priest with his sprinkler and his holy water? <laughs> Go up these steps. Go up above? Am I going to have to bite you, Marin? Good God in heaven, who gave me that shot? Damn it to hell, and damn you too. Now we're stuck in a pitch black room. Holy Saint Mary, come to my aid. I'm pretty sure I'm in the tomb of all my ancestors. Did somebody say something? Did you hear a voice? <laughs> I think the friar's vial must have contained a sleeping potion, and I am here in the tomb where my father buried me. Yeah. Somebody spoke a second time. Holy St. Paul, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from it. Here, take this candle, and in the next chapel over in the church, go light it right away. We're in. Huh? Sorry? You heard what I said? Well, how could I possibly go alone? What, can't you see? My knees are weak from fear. Get going. Where's your backbone? <laughs> Oh, it happened again! Who's pushing me now? I'll go myself. You stay right there. Alone? Don't be an idiot. I'll get it myself. What's there to fear? Well, nothing loosens the bowels like fear. It's like a rhubarb enema. Over there, where I saw the light, I heard some whispering from a couple of people, it seems to me. Oh, do the dead keep talking after they die? You heard that voice now, didn't you? They say blood goes to the heart. My blood's already below the belt. I'm sinking even lower than that. It seems to be coming from over there. You think four corpses could have a chat with each other without the devil letting them do it? What should we do? You're asking me? How would I know? Can you feel the wall? I'm trying to. The back of the head. I touched a corpse. Oh, St. Luke, St. Blaise, and St. Anthony. What's there? Oh, some kind of bulge, I think. Oh, so soft and fat. Like lard, maybe. Oh. This part here must be the skull. <gasps> he must have had the face of a mule. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I think he's biting me. What did you say? Oh, silly me, what a fool. I'm sorry, sir, I had my finger. You had your finger where? You see, I had my finger between the cracks, and I thought the thing was biting me. What else do you feel? Oh, <laughs> please don't shove me. Where did they bury our Tommy? Please don't remind me. Oh, oh. What's the matter? Oh, please forgive me, sir. I swear I'll never do it again. Forgive you for what? The trout that went missing the other day. I ate it. Also the sugar pears. Stop it, you clown. Alas, nowhere to hide myself. They're coming near, and now there's no place else to go. Good sirs, are you alive or dead? Oh, oh I'm dead! Oh, it goes for me, I know. Did something bump you? Yes, something did. If I survive this, I hope I'll be finished with crypts and craziness. Love, let your light shine upon me. Give me the strength to speak her name. Juliet! <clears throat> My Juliet! <laughs> My Juliet! Oh, great, you'll wake up Octavio and 30 more to make up a set. My Juliet! That voice, it feels as though it's telling me that all is well. Is it Octavio's? I don't know, but I have to call to him. Octavio? Is someone calling him now? They're gonna do a slip from limb! No, not Octavio. Then who? It's Romeo. Romeo? Do you doubt me? Give me a sign. It was the friar's doing. Benvolio said with artful cunning, he mixed a drink that made it seem like you were dead. He also sent for me to come. And while this trip kept everyone in the dark, I was to rescue you from this black tomb, which I have done. What did I give you on that night, the first, unhappily, that we spent together? Some relics. And you gave me? Two gems set in gold to represent our marriage. And in the morning? A feather inlaid with diamonds. So far, they're not too bad, your signs. Uh, but 
What did I write on my very first letter to you? She's got more questions to ask? <laughs> to my soulmate, by all the fates and all their daughters, just tell him if you're alive or dead. Unless the dead are something like otters, you know, being neither fish nor flesh. Let me be. No rush. Take your time. Take more. Husband, soulmate, come to me. Into my breast your voice that pour all I have lost. <laughs> yeah, you suffered. Wrap it up. End of story. Time to go. Oh, look, it's getting late. Because the danger in this scene is imagined by superstitious characters rather than imposed by supernatural fate, it, it, it lends itself to slapstick exaggeration and physical comedy and calls for blocking gestures and tone of voice that will foreground the humor of Lope's script. Lope obviously plays with comedia conventions when he changes course from tragedy to comedy, but con con conventionality may in part explain his decision to end the play happily. Ed Friedman has made a similar argument. He wrote, Lope fits the source material into the comedia framework of which he is the principal designer and proponent. The shift from tragedy to tragic comedy is a radical modification if one sees the story as an indictment against youthful lust but less so if one accentuates the restoration of order. Castelvinas y Monteses belongs to Lope's mature period uh, as a playwright, and, it fits ha it, and its happier ending fits within the conventions he has established for the comedia genre. The comedic formula works for Lope and his contemporaries. When the plot begins with a young couple who sees each other, falls in love, and thus places the honor of the dama's father or older brother at risk, the solution to the problem and the resolution to the play typically involves a somewhat begrudging agreement that the young couple will marry. This broad outline functions in such well-known plays as Lopez La Dama Boba, Tirso's Don Quixote de las Calzas Verdes, and Calderón's La Dama Duende. Perhaps it makes more sense to Lope to follow the convention. Young Rosello meets unmarried Julia, their fathers serve as blocking characters, but eventually the order distor disturbed can be restored through marriage, rather than following the tragic plot line outlined in Bandello's novella and the other source texts. Beyond comedia conventions, though, Lope, Lope's sudden shift from tragedy to comedy reveals something about his play's relationships to its source texts. Shakespeare's play pays homage to its intertextual predecessors. Romeo and Juliet adapts the story told in the, Brook, in the Brooks poem, Bandello's novella, and the other versions. The play moves from the page to the stage, but remains faithful to the tragic mode of all the previous versions. Shakespeare's recasting of the story honors the source text by providing an aesthetically superior rendering of the same story. Rodriguez Badendijk suspects that Shakespeare found this kind of, dif of fidelity difficult. With reference to the portrayal of Romeo, she describes, when he is informed of his banishment from Verona, he throws himself upon the ground and flails about hysterically. The comic potential of the story surfaces irresistibly, as if Shakespeare himself could not resist sending up this material, however determined he was to bring it off as tragedy in the end. Rossello behaves very differently than Romeo, and Lope responds to the story very differently than Shakespeare. A few critics of Castelvinus have read the final scenes as incongruous. Some believe that in shifting to comedy at the end of the play, Lope divulges that he does not understand and show proper respect for the story. Rodriguez Badendijk disagrees and concludes that Lope's play is the coherent product of a belief system still intact with tap roots deep in Spanish Christianity, but with trunk branches and vivid foliage rich with the sap of the playwright's own mature and life-affirming genius. Far from trivializing the Romeo and Juliet story, Lope's tragicomedia rendering has made sense of it. I agree that Lope does make sense of the Romeo and Juliet plotline, but I also believe that he trivializes it. Rodriguez Badendijk re recognized Shakespeare's urge to send up the source material, but does not seem to credit Lope's brilliance in carrying off the send up. 
that Lope trivializes the tragic, highly romanticized outcome of Bandello's novella does not make Castel Venus trivial or incongruous. It makes Castel Venus a parody. Castel Venus humorously imitates the plotline of Bandello's novella and points out the flaws in its execution and ideas by offering an amusing and simultaneously more reasonable alternative ending. In light of, of, the, of Lope's parody, Shakespeare's denouement of double suicide appears even more ridiculous and unnecessary than Bandello's ending in which Julieta expires from grief. In theorizing parody, Robert Chambers establishes its tendency to push conventional limits and rejects the notion that parody functions solely as imitation. As a result of these forays, this is him, I'm quoting, both inside and outside conventional boundaries, parody is the primary source of innovation and change in the art. The rage for novelty in modernist and postmodernist art would have been hopelessly thwarted without constant parodic transfusion. But this is a truth almost univer universally unacknowledged given parody's absurdly wrong-headed reputation for being the very antithesis of originality. The rage for novelty was also alive and well in the early modern era. Don Quixote was only the most successful example of a parodic transfusion in the period. When Lope turns away from Bandello's tragic ending, he includes his greatest moments of creative originality and comic genius in the play. Lope teases his audience, playing with expectations. Foster believes that tragic comedy evokes mixed tragic and comic responses in its audience in a way that is both stimulating and provocative. The contrast between the tragedy of the first, act of Lope, first acts of Lope's play and the surprising and abrupt shift to a comic parodic register uh, will impact audience reception. Audience surprise, laugh, light will likely increase in the final scenes because the spectators have waded through potential danger and darkness beforehand. One hilarious scene, sometimes alluded to as a plot device by critics in a single line of an essay, but never fully discussed, features Julia as she takes control of her destiny by speaking as a ghost to her father. Our students in the BYU Spanish Golden Age Theater Project produced this scene to perform in schools in El Paso, Texas, to prepare the students to attend the Chamisal Siglo de Oro Drama Festival and see the Andac Stage Company's performance. This particular clip was filmed at Brigham Young University, which explains why partway through the scene, one of the actors ad-libs a humorous reference to the high rate of marriages among students in Utah. Let's see. Padre, Puerto Diego, Padre, esto es Julia, me la curva el Diego, Padre, desde el otro mundo vengo a verte y a hablarte, escucha y atiende, y pues hija, o que tu voz conozco, el no verte ni tristeza, Quieres que salga la forma en que estoy y a ti me presente. Hija, que no me siento con fuerzas, solo las aprendiste. Yo me maté por tu casa. ¿Por mi casa? Claramente, pues tú me casabas por la fuerza. Pero no mi intento fue bueno. Advierte.
By playing a ghost, Julia can reveal to her father that she had married Rosselo and extract a promise from her father that he will not kill her husband, thus setting up for the happy resolution of the play when she reveals that she is still very much alive. In addition to amplifying the humor and sharp contrast between, uh, in, in addition to amplifying the humor, the sharp contrast between tragedy and comedy will allow the audience of Castel Venus to experience a sense of genuine relief. A growing number of stage directors, health healthcare experts, and parents feel uncomfortable with the treatment of teen suicide in Romeo and Juliet. Psychologist Stanton Peel argues that Shakespeare's play accurately portrays the danger in his 2008 article. Romeo and Juliet's Death Trip, Addictive Love and Teen Suicide. In Castel Venus, Lope suggests a world, of different, uh, a world of different, more hopeful possibilities. The leading lady, Julia, and her suitor, Roselo, can overcome the previous generation's hatred. Their parents' enmity needs not lead to their suicide. Murder, rather than suicide, in the final act of El Caballero de Olmedo has caused literary critics to return again and again to the question of tragedy and the search for the tragic flaw in the character of the play's protagonist, Don Alonso. Second only to this discussion of tragedy and the criticism is the concern about the shift from comedy to tragedy in the play. Perhaps Menendez Pelayo entered the conversation first. Los dos primeros actos son una deliciosa comedia de costumbre, una intriga de amor algo primaveral y celestinesca. La gracia y la viveza de estas escenas contrasten con el terror trágico y es tan, que es tan hondo y dominante en el acto tercero. En el Caballero de Olmedo, Don Alonso falls in love at first sight with Doña Inés. Alonso con, con, contracts, contracts uh, Fabia, a go-between of ill repute, to carry a message to Inés. Inés writes back and leaves a green ribbon as a love token for Alonso to retrieve from the iron bars of her window before Alonso can approach her house at nightfall. Inés's longtime suitor, Rodrigo, comes, whom she despises, arrives and divides the ribbon with his sidekick, Fernando, who courts Inés's sister. The next day, Don Rodrigo meets with Inés's father and gains his approval to marry Inés. Alonso visits Ines in her home and woos her with bad poetry recited by his servant Tello. Ines's father enters suddenly, forcing Alonso and Tello to hide. To avoid marrying Rodrigo, Ines tells her father that she has a religious vocation and must become a nun. This falsehood leads to Tello's plan that he and Fabia should enter the household, coming and going with messages from Alonso, disguised as Ines's tutors, to prepare her to enter the convent. In all of these plot twists of the first two acts, the play unfolds as a typical comic comedia filled with effusive young love, clever puns, deceptions of the blocking characters, and unresolved plot complications. The tone and modality of the play, however, turn completely in the third act when Rodrigo, with a gang of accomplices, plots and carries out the assassination of Don Alonso. El Caballero does not work like typical early modern tra um, tragic comedies. The plot does not move from tr from through tragic foreboding to resolve in a happy ending, but rather in the opposite direction. In this, uh, in this scene, El Caballero anticipates uh, a more modern trend, moving through, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, in this sense, I'm sorry, we're not ready for the scene. In this sense, El Caballero anticipates a more modern trend, moving through comic moments toward an, uh, an, an unhappy, unavoidable resolution. According to Foster, modern um, tragic comedy is no longer a form of comedy, but has shifted the emphasis to the modal and adjectival tragic in tragic comedy. In one, uh, one critic of Lopez's play suggested that it be labeled a comitragedia. El Caballero breaks with convention and, like Castelvinas y Monteses, flouts the, the spectator's expectations. Once again, Lope teases his audience, offering them all the comic conventions that should promise a happy ending. This promise comes through clearly in the scene in which Fabia and Tello enter Ines's home as tutors. This clip was filmed during the Chamisal Siglo de Oro Drama Festival and performed by students in our BYU Spanish Golden Age Theater project. The director imagined the play in terms of storytelling in the outdoors, hence the trees and audience members on stage throughout the play. Galas celestiales son las que ya mi vida espera. No, hasta que yo lo quiera. Obedece a Dios razón. Va a ser en la que está. Y venga con vos. ¿Quién es la señora Doña Inés? 
con el señor se casa? Madre honrada, esta que ves y yo su padre. Que sea muchos años y ella vea al dueño que vos no ves. Aunque de él, señor, espero que os ha de obligar piadoso a que aceptéis tal esposo que es muy noble caballero. ¿Cómo, madre, si lo es? Sabiendo que anda a buscar quien venga a morir a los verdes años de Inés, quien la guíe, quien la muestre las cenitas del Señor y al camino del amor como a principal cariestre, hice oración en verdad y tal impulso me dio que vengo a ofrecerme yo para esta necesidad, aunque soy gran pecador. ¿Esta es la mujer Inés que has menester? Esa es la que menester ahora, madre. ¡Abráceme! ¡Qué visto que el silicio me hace mal! ¡Bueno, visto, verdad igual! En el rostro trae escrito lo que tiene mi corazón. ¡Oh, qué gracia! ¡Oh, qué belleza! ¡Alcance tu gentileza, mi deseo y bendición! ¿Tienes oratorio? Madre, comienzo a ser buena ahora. Como soy gran pecadora, estoy temiendo a tu padre. No le pienso yo estorbar. Tan divina pecadora. En vano, infernal dragón, la pensabas de bola. No ha de casarse en Medina. Monasterio tiene Olmedo. Domine, si tanto puedo. Adjugando una festina. Un ángel, la mujer. El poder para esto lo que buscáis es para que no te lo Para ti, mi padre, que no te dirá después por pecto. ¿Qué buscáis, un estudiante de la iglesia me dijeron? ¿Qué hay de estos señores se sabe dónde está el intento? <risa> asked for a performance in a comic register. Uh, Alexander Sampson and Jonathan Thacker recently recognized the scene as typical. In other plays, such as Tirso de Molina's Marta la Piedosa, they say a false vow of chastity to avoid an unwanted marriage is a comic ingredient. But the conventionality of this scene extends to the admission of Fabia and Teo to the house. Marta la Piedosa tricks her father by charitably bringing her, uh, by charitably bringing her suitor disguised as a poor student into her home to teach her Latin. Two decades earlier, Lope himself had used a version of this plot twist in El Maestro de Danzar, bringing Florella's lover into the house as her dance instructor. Without question, this plot development in which a father as blocking character re believes he contributes to his daughter's refinement or piety while in actuality facilitating her access to the suitor she prefers has comic intent. El Maestro de Danzar and Marta la Piadosa are full-blown comic comedias. In El Caballero de Olmedo, the conventional plot development under question shares not only the same outline as in the earlier plays, but also the same comic mode. El Caballero has more obvious source text than, than other comic comedias. Critics have looked closely at El Caballero's allusions to and intertextual characters from Fernando de Rojas's La Celestina, and debates have occurred about the her, her, uh, historicity of the Caballero story. That, that question aside, it does seem clear that Lope builds up a story around a short pre-existing song, que de noche le mataron al Caballero, la Gala de Medina, la Flor de Olmedo. The play extends four lines into 2,732. The relationship between El Caballero and these source texts is one of homage rather than parody. The play ends tragically not because tragedy follows logically or conventionally from its first two comic acts, but because the song which it glosses ends tragically and La Celestina ends in tragedy as well. In this case, the source texts force the tragic ending to form part of their intertext with Lope's play. The surprise in El Caballero de Olmedo is not the ending. The, the audience knows that from the beginning. Rather, the comic register of the first two acts shows off Lope's originality and astonishes the audience. The stark contrast and tension between the comic act and the play's unhappy final uh, scenes heighten the tragedy of the denouement and thereby strengthen the audience's uh, experience of pity and fear. Lope's text doubles our anxiety and fears for Alonso's well-being by splitting the protagonist into the lone man on the dark road and his shadow, 
who appears and warns him to turn back. Los Barracos' performance of the play further fragments Alonso, uh, who, stares, who shares the stage and his lines with Federico Garcia Lorca as well. Lorca directed his theater group La Barraca in their traveling performance of El Caballero de Olmedo. The doubling of Alonso by Lorca increases the audience's tragic response in the scene performed in this clip on the Chamisal stage. A mí me suelen llamar el caballero de Olmedo. Y yo estoy vivo. No puedo deciros de este cantar más historias ni ocasión. De que a una sabia la oí. Si os importa, yo cumplí con deciros la canción. Volved atrás. No paséis de este arroyo. En mi nobleza fuera ese temor bajeza. Muy necio valor tenéis. Volved, volved a Medina. Ven tú conmigo. No puedo. Que de sombras finge el miedo. Que de engaño se imagina. Oye, escucha. ¿Dónde fue que apenas sus pasos siento? ¡Ah, labrador! ¡Oye, aguarda! ¡Aguarda! Responde lejos. Pero es canción que por algún hombre hicieron de Olmedo. Y los de Medina en este camino han muerto. A la mitad de él estoy. ¿Qué han de decir? Si me vuelvo. Gente viene. No me pesa. Y allá van y hay con ellos. ¿Quién va? Un hombre, no me ven. Deténgase. Caballeros. Si acaso necesidad los fuerza a pasos como estos. Desde aquí a mi casa hay poco. No habrá menester dineros. Que de día y en la calle se los doy a cuantos veo que me hacen honra en pedirlos. Quítese las armas luego. ¿Para qué? Para rendilla. ¿Saben quién soy? El de Olmedo. El matador de los toros que viene arrogante y decía afrentar los de Medina. El que deshonra a don Pedro con alcahuetes infame. Si fuera de Salomenos nobles vosotros allá, pues tuvisteis tanto tiempo. ¡Me hablarades y no ahora que solo a mi casa vuelvo! Allá en la reja, a donde dejaste la capa huyendo fuera bien. Y no en cuadrilla a medianoche, soberbios. Pero confieso, villanos, que esta estimación os debo, que aun siendo tantos... Sois pocos. Yo vengo a matar, no vengo a desafíos, que entonces te matara cuerpo a cuerpo. ¡Pírale! Traidores sois, pero sin armas de fuego no pudiera desmatarme. Ugarte, ¿quién es? Ahora entiendo que poco crédito di a los avisos del cielo. Valor propio me ha engañado y muerto en vidias y tel. ¡Ay de mí! ¿Qué haré en un campo tan solo? Miedo me dieron estos hombres. Y a caballo van hacia Medina huyendo. Si a don Alonso habían visto, pregunté. No respondieron. Mala señal. Voy temblando. Dios mío. Piedad. Yo muero. Ay, Inés. De lastimosas quejas. Siento triste seco. Si aquella parte suena, no está del camino lejos, quien la verdad. <ríe> no me ha quedado sangre. Pienso que el sombrero puede tenerse en el aire solo en cualquiera cabello. lists the kind, uh, uh, the kind of audience responses evoked by the tragic portions of tragic comedy. She refers to an intense emotional involvement and a, and a, pain, a, a painful awareness of the ironic discrepancy between what is and what might have been. In El Caballero, it is precisely because the first two acts are conventionally comic 
and therefore make us believe uh, that Alonso and Inez can end up happily married at the end of the play, that Alonso's death matters deeply to the audience. The spectators of Los Barracos' performance of the play will suffer also because they will wish for Lorca to go on staging plays and writing poetry, even as they know from the beginning that the hope is impossible. Over the course of his brilliant career that spans some 55 years, Lope de Vega wrote and rewrote dozens of conventional plot lines in hundreds of plays. His differing treatment of rash young love in Castelvinas y Monteses and El Caballero de Olmedo demonstrates very obviously his versatility as a playwright. Taken together, the two plays reveal the kinds of choices Lope made as he dealt with intertextual material and the making and breaking of comedia conventions. Both plays are wonderful original theatrical works because of their interactions with source texts and other, pre other previous works and theatrical convention. Lope parodied the story of tragic young love in Castelvinas and paid homage to it in El Caballero. And he did so by foregrounding the tragic comic mode in both plays. The disparity between the comic and the tragic in these plays amplifies the happy ending in the one case and the tragedy in the other. And in both instances, this affects audience reception. Surprised by the extreme contrast, the spectator will laugh more loudly or gasp more deeply, feel genuinely relieved or painfully desperate. Performances of these plays should celebrate the sharp contrast and seeming incongruity and allow contemporary audiences to experience the extremes of Lope's theater's cathartic experience. There's one minute. Night scenes, night scenes are always really important to me. And um, in fact, well, let's see. And when we did Castel, the Castelvinas y Montesis um, night scenes in the schools in outreach, we did them on purpose in the light and talked to, uh, talked to the students about that um, and about the way it worked in the corrales. Um, um, my student directors are always convinced that it's better in the dark, and it frustrates me because it's particularly in a play, um, you know, more so in Castelvines y Monteses than in, uh, in El Caballero de Olmedo, um, it, the fact that it's taking place in the light makes it funnier because we can see the comic stage business when people are, you know, walking around on stage bumping into each other or, um, you know, not finding what they're trying to find. And so, um, I, I don't know if this is answering the question, but, we, but I, I'm, I, I'm never able to impose on my students exactly what I wish they would do sometimes, but that's because I'm always trying to resurrect, you know, what was happening in the Corral Theater rather than, um, you know, sort of celebrating the technology, the technology that we have today. But I do think, with reference to night scenes, that we lose some of the humor in night scenes when we stage them in the dark. And I think, and I, and I'm, I think that's a, a, a loss that's unfortunate. Yes, sir. Corey. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I found your interesting choice. <coughs> Very interesting. Bringing in two things. And uh, having seen the source text of Castelvinas and Montesquieu, how much change do you think is implicit? How much change does this particular example take in Shakespeare that does not? Oh, Shakespeare does all kinds of innovating. He does, I mean, he, he adds characters, he adds scenes. Uh, there's, there's a lot uh, a lot of new stuff in Shakespeare that's not in the original. But, um, but I, I do think that, he, I, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that he holds on to the tragedy that's in every single one of the, pre the previous texts. I mean, it's, I think he feels, I mean, it feels like stuck 
in the tragedy. Maybe that's not fair to say, but, I, but he, that he does. He, he holds on to the tragedy. You're welcome. Well, well, the, the reason that, that um, I got interested in this project was because um, we performed both of those plays, and sometimes uh, people feel unhappy when, you, when they view a tragic comedy because they really want, the spectators really want, or maybe I should say um, scholars of Golden Age theater rather than just your average spectator. This average spectators deal with tragic comedy just fine. But scholars of Golden Age Theater really want El Caballero de, de Olmedo to be a tragedy, a complete tragedy. And, and they often really want, in fact, I think the stage company, Andex company from um, Hollywood, really wants um, Castelvinas y Monteses to be a comedy. They don't, want it, they don't want to read the tragic comedy part. And so I, um, I wanted to figure out why it is that Lope, you know, to be able to explain why it is that Lope cares about um, shifting from comedy and tragedy so starkly the way that I believe he does in these two plays. And that's how I came to the question of parody. I mean, it seemed like uh, if you think about the way that the, ch that the plays interact with their predecessors, that's one explanation for what's going on and the way the plays are working. So I, I, I mean, I have to be you know, honest that I haven't thought about other plays by Lope as being parodic, but I really think, I mean, this one to me seems clear at this point because he knew, there were, there, I mean, there were multiple source texts and those source texts are all tragic. Yes, sir. In, in, in some ways, you know what I think though, um, you know, tragic comedy is, is in some ways a term that you could apply to all Golden Age theater and that you could apply to all Shakespearean and Elizabethan theater because they, the, the plays contain tragic and comic elements. What happens in these two plays that I think is significantly different is that there's not a balance of mix. I mean, it's not, in my reading of the plays anyway, there, you don't have, um, you know, mostly tragedy with a fool thrown in who will have some comic moments throughout the play. Rather, it feels to me very much in these plays like you have, this is the comic section of the play and now we're gonna shift to tragedy and vice versa. This is the tragic section of the play and now we're gonna shift to comedy. And so I think that contrast, that stark contrast heightens the experience. I do think that in tragic comedy generally, what happens in terms of the audience experience is that um, they, that that the audience has to simultaneously experience the, you know, sort of pity and fear at the same time that they're experiencing sort of this, you know, distancing because this is funny. At, you know, there are these funny moments mixed in with the pity and fear. So I think it is related, but I think these plays do it in a different way. I, 
I think I think the the playwright, the actors, and the audience are all three incredibly versatile. And the, the play seems to be echoing that versatility <laughs> of the audience. And so in a sense, they seem to be formed by, which may be too harsh, but they're formed by the ability of the audience to navigate or to create this, this, this completely fantastic space, which is both And part of that has to do with the conventionality of the of the genre, in the period at, at, and, and the conventionality of the Golden Age theater. I, I think that because the conventions come with it, the audience is able to move with it that way. But I think we will need to move. But, but, but again, the thing is there are actors, many, many experts in our cabaret and Maria, Maria who have different things. So the work has a sense of complete balance. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you. Time.